Hey everyone, it's Ali Coram here. Now, Mark Minervini is called a market wizard and the proof is in the pudding. He's won two US investing championships and most recently was winner in 2021. Mark was on IB Live and I was able to interview him about some of his time-tested strategies for success and here are a couple of highlights. Now, uh, speaking of volume, Mark, how do you factor that into your buying decisions? How crucial is it for you to see that above average volume? Or if it checks off all of the other boxes, do you kind of give volume a pass? How do you treat that? Well, volume on the breakout, I'm, I'm more looking at the volume characteristics within the base and then post breakout. If I don't get the volume on the initial breakout, that can happen, you know, and, that, and you're going to see that in hindsight, you can extrapolate during the day. If your stock is breaking out at 1030, you can try to get an idea of how the volume is running by extrapolating it. Um, but you may not get the volume on the breakout. And sometimes, believe it or not, I, I, I look at that as, as a good sign in this day and age where you have so much information flowing so quickly that everybody jumps on a stock really quick on the retail level and all this volume runs in. And this is what David Ryan and I often talk about at the master trader program uh, is identifying the, the difference between retail buying and institutional buying. And sometimes that retail buying can uh, look like institutional buying in the short term when you see this volume surge. But what happens is, is that it fizzles out. And real institutional buying, when, when an institution has to buy a name, you know, they're in there buying for days. You know, they're, they're taking a big position. They don't usually put the position on all at one time. Um, and you see support in the, in, the, in the form of follow through on the breakout and also on pullbacks, seeing very good support on pullbacks and the, the stock usually recovering fairly quickly. So it's the, it's the resilience of the breakout. Bill Berger, of course, many people probably don't know Bill Berger now. It's so long ago, but he was a, a great manager and I, I got the pleasure to meet him. Uh, him and O'Neill were two of my really, uh, you know, uh, favorite people to uh, to emulate uh, when I first started. And Bill Berger said, "I buy." I asked him about his, you know, his method for success. He said, "Why? How come you're doing so much better than everybody else?" He said, "Son, I buy tennis balls and I sell eggs." And and I and I had no idea what that meant, but that ended up being worth millions to me. Um, and that is, you know, the, the the stocks that are under accumulation, they they're resilient. They snap back, and the ones that don't. Uh, just uh, you know, fall and 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 go splat, if you will. So that's one thing. <laughs> Love the imagery there. Uh, where would you be setting your stop? Uh, keep a tight leash. Today's today's low. Yesterday's low. Do you use a twenty one day or similar moving average? Where are you <clears throat> looking to get out, or well, yeah. are you just looking at a percentage? So, you know, two, three, four percent. So the challenge with the lower price stocks is sometimes is that they're volatile and and it, to, to get a technical stop <clears throat> and find a good area where, you know, you say, oh, wow, this this chart is definitely soured at this level. Um, sometimes that's a pretty that's a lot of risk. You know, it might be 15 percent lower uh, when it's when it exceeds the the 8 percent. You know, I, I, I don't like to have any loss greater than 8 percent. If I stagger stops and maybe have a, a you know, a four and a 10 or, or, or something like that, I might go to 10 percent on half of it. But it's still going to average 8%. So with something like this, you know, I might use yeah. a mathematical stop where I just come up with a percentage. Um, and, and, and again, once it gets going here, let's just say this stock start, it's starting to move a little bit. Let's just say it, it runs up here and it's up, uh, you know, gets up to uh, nine bucks, nine and a half bucks. Now you've got, you're up very nice on the day. Now it would be very abnormal <laughs> for you to erase all that, that daily gain and take out yesterday's low because you would be just like the Chris said in the market, it would be an outside day and you'd have this large engulfing. So I, once it's up, I might actually move that stop up and use yesterday's low as the stop. Uh, again, I'm not just arbitrarily doing that. I'm doing that because now it does, it wouldn't be normal for that stock to come below that low today if you had that big outside day. So I tighten up on it. Mm -hmm. You just want to be careful. You don't get too tight. And you start choking off the trade and you don't give it room to act uh, natural. One thing that I wanted to ask you about before we get too far away from it on Voyager, you mentioned it being uh, sort of a more low priced stock here. So yeah. do you have, do you have a liquidity requirement that you, that you are looking at a, a dollar volume requirement? 
I don't, you know, I don't cut them off and say, Hey, just because it's trading a hundred thousand shares a day, I'm not going to trade it. I'm just going to, I'm going to bring my position size down the stock like that. I might buy a, you know, a couple thousand shares, maybe one or 2000 shares. If the stock can handle the liquidity and handle the volume. Then I'm going to, I'm going to take a much bigger size. So it, I'm just adjusting. I always say I'd rather have a small position in a stock that, you know, in a leader and a stock that mm -hmm. can go up uh, big, then have a big position in some laggard. Um, so, you know, a small position in a, in a great performing stock could give you the same type of, uh, uh, can, can be the same type of effect on your portfolio as a large position in something that's, uh, you know, a stalwart. So are there any gold, silver, or other precious metal <laughs> stocks right now that have popped up on your screens? Well, the thing is, is that, you know, everything could be great. The fundamentals could be there. The, the, the macro, you know, the whole picture could be there. But if I don't get that very crisp entry point and that low risk entry point, then I'm going to avoid it. And I might miss, I might miss a move in a sector or an area just simply because the, you know, the, the low risk wasn't there. And I often talk about this on how the risk for me and, and the, the uh, entry point is actually a selection, part of the selection process. Actually, it's the final part of the selection process. So some people think of that risk and they don't think of it actually as a selection tool of a, of, a, of, a, of a buy criteria. So, but that is my final buy criteria is whether I can get into that trade at a low risk. And the reason why is because what we're trying to do here, and again, what people like Bill O'Neill and uh, uh, you know, Paul Tudor Jones, and you can go all the way back to Jesse Livermore and myself, what we've been able to do, and, and the reason why we've made the big returns and been able to uh, uh, have longevity over, over decades is because we were experts at creating what I call asymmetric leverage. Um, this is a term that I learned from one of my mentors and idols, uh, Larry Height, who I also talk to on a very regular basis, almost every week. Um, Larry is in Market Wizards, of course, and I learned more from the Market Wizards interview with Larry and you know, Paul Tudor Jones and a few of those guys than probably any other place, or at least was inspired the most from those interviews and I was uh, been very fortunate to become friends with Larry. Um, and, and again, he uses the term asymmetric uh, um, leverage. I call it asymmetric volatility. But simply what it means is that you're not just looking to put a stop and, and, and uh, stop the bleeding in just any old name. The whole key is to go in the areas that have this tremendous upside. So now when they have that upside potential and you cut off the downside, you basically create a, a skewed bell curve as you as you play those hands. Now you're playing aces because, you know, like in poker, that that hand may not win every time. But you put you play aces over time and you're going to have a skewed bell curve to the right. They're, they're going to win and they're going to they're going to perform much better than a lower a, a lower hand, of course. So the key is, is to be in those areas. And that's why it's so important to go into the leading stocks, the stocks that have the potential to make those big moves and to make those moves with little volatility, high alpha names, which are not going to get a lot of standard deviation, because now that that volatility has to be on both sides. What you're trying to do is cut off the downside and participate in the upside. And that's really the whole trick. That's sort of the holy grail, if you will. Uh, I, I use a, a sort of a technique or an approach what I, co I call relative prioritizing. And it just simply means that some things, if they're strong enough, will override others. So I, want, I might buy a stock that doesn't have the earnings or doesn't have the sales if, if the technicals are strong enough and it makes sense with the group. So for a biotech stock, you know, 75, 80% of biotech stocks don't have earnings. They're trading on a new drug, you know, in the pipeline and so forth. So if that stock is super strong, it's a 98 relative strength coming out of a, a high tide flag. I'm going to play that even though it doesn't have the earnings or the sales or anything on the fundamentals, because uh, that, that, that's, that, that catalyst uh, is probably not being driven by that. So uh, categorizing the stock, knowing what type of situation you're dealing with, then allows you to know what tool you're going to apply. And that's that relative prioritizing, judging whether, you know, this is strong enough to override that. And, and, and in terms of, you know, fundamentals, you know, revenue, you need revenue at some point. So uh, the uh, earnings and the margins are not strong enough to override the revenue for uh, any length of time. At some point, the revenue has to come in. So um, I, I start at the strongest names and I work my way down. And I'm, the majority of the stocks that I buy are going to have 89 relative strength or higher. 
that's where I find the momentum is. And that's sort of the sweet spot that I want to be in. Something else that I think would be great just to kind of expand on this point is is the whole bottom fishing rally that we are seeing and why we don't we don't want to be focusing on those those stocks. It's the stocks that are in the uptrends and and continuing to make new highs that are are the leaders like you were saying instead of you know trying to catch those moves off the bottom. Bottom fishing is very seductive and you have to remember bottom fishing is like you got to think about it like um, looking at a lottery winner. Every week there's a lottery winner, mm-hmm. but every week the name is different. Okay. So, so, and that's the, the key about trading and investing is longevity. It's all about, can you do something over time and can you do it consistently? Um, it's, this isn't about, we're not trying to get lucky here. You know, this is a, are you going to make it a career or even a hobby that, you know, a, a, a investing that might turn into, you know, of course, uh, you handling your own money and self-directing your your investments, uh, it needs to have consistency uh, to be able to perform over time. So again, you might, you know, you could look at these stocks, there's stocks that, and we're not talking about little crappy names. We're talking about PayPal and Square and some very big names that have gone down. And this is, of course, I won't get into it too deep, my 50-80 rule, um, which again, just goes back to Bill O'Neill. You know, Bill, if you go read Bill's books, you'll see, he talks about past leaders when they top, they, they fall an average of 70, 72%. <clears throat> I found that there's a 50% chance that a past leader will go down 80% and an 80% chance that it'll go down 50%. I call it the 50-80 rule. Well, guess what? You know how many people made a case for buying PayPal when it was down around 200 and then they made a case when it was down around 160 and then they made a case when it's down at 120 and they're, they keep buying the low buying the low will the real low please stand up you know in hindsight it's very seductive in hindsight to look and say oh wow look at how much have i just bought it at the low here yeah if you had a crystal ball um but again that stock's in a in a stage four downtrend, which is we want to completely avoid. Um, and until you get into that mindset, I mean, maybe if you're a value, you're following a Bill Miller type strategy, and you're going to go through long periods of underperformance and have big drawdowns and uh, have to, you know, you buy stocks and be at losses. And, you know, I don't want to be at a loss at all. You know, I'm trying to buy the stock and be at a profit immediately. Um, you, you want to buy downtrends, maybe? Sure. That's a whole different approach. And it's a, it's a painful approach, too. Um, so, so, again, something like, like PayPal. And, and you might say, well, PayPal, you know, it's a big cap company. You can go back, you know, they, they said that about Eastman Kodak and, and, uh, and all the stocks of the uh, back in the, in the 70s and the 80s when these stocks corrected and were down big and then took 25 years to come back to break even while the S&P went up 500% and leading stocks in new areas that had new products went, went up to up thousands of percent. Uh, so uh, again, th- these are laggards now. These are stocks that have topped. And, uh, and the institutions have run out of them uh, and, and they usually underperform for quite a while. Uh, this is a six relative strength. This is, this is, the, this is on the, yeah, if you're, if you're looking at a power play, it turned it upside down. That's what we have here. Just the opposite. You know, the, 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 you want the top 5%, this is the bottom 5%. When we look back, we're not just arbitrarily picking this stuff. That's, that's the beauty about what I do and what was, is derived from Bill O'Neill work, um, uh, you know, David Ryan, myself. This is based on studying the, the biggest and the fastest movers since going back to the 1800s. We didn't just come up with this stuff off the top of our head. Now, here's the thing about, about stage uh, analysis and, and trends. Stan Weinstein didn't have that when he came up with stage analysis, didn't really have the, the computing power that O'Neill had and that I later had. Uh, and we really quantified this more, um, but he was certainly on to the right thing here. What we found was, is that when you look at the big winning stocks and the fast moving stocks, 98% of them are in a stage two uptrend before they make that move, okay? So now you have to ask yourself a question. Next time you're tr- buying a stock that's hitting new lows and it's in a downtrend, do you wanna be in the 98% club of a probability or do you wanna be in the 2% club? Which probability would you like? Personally, I'd like a 98% probability that I'm onto a big winner. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that, that pretty much ends the discussion right there. Mic drop. No, uh, yeah, well <laughs> <Totally>. said. <laughs> so well said, Mark. So how do you stay so open-minded and flexible mentally with all of the different scenarios that could played out and have played out, uh, you know, especially over the, the last month? 
Well, the way I stay mentally flexible and objective is because all for all the times in my past 40 years of trading, when I got rigid and I got my head handed to me. Um, so that's, that's, you know, humility um, built on, built on pain um, of, of when you start thinking you know something. You know, I, I tell people often uh, that when you get to a level that I'm at and you've been trading for so long and you've had a lot of success, you can very easily get, get cocky and start thinking that you know something and you start circumventing the, the things that got you there uh, and start trying to guess and, and, and changing your approach. Uh, I, I think one of my strengths has been that, you know, through uh, the 40 years of trading that I'm still just as disciplined and still just as humble with the, with, stocks as I was in day one. Um, and I think that's the key to my longevity is to, is to stay objective. And like I said, the whole theme of this whole day for me that I started it with was I let stocks pick me. I don't pick them. And that's what I try to do uh, consistently to stick with that uh, uh, of, uh, of me being the caboose and the market being the engine. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, some great thoughts to wrap here on. And once again, Mark, thank you so much for spending the morning with us. And I know our audience always really appreciates it when you come on and especially with uh, everything that we've seen in 2022, uh, all of the twists and turns. It's great to uh, come back to what those time tested strategies are and what's worked for you. So really appreciate it. Uh, well, your audience is in great hands without me, and and uh, I'll enjoy being here. I hope hope I brought some uh, some insights, and uh, it's great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please be sure to subscribe to my channel so that way you can get notifications when more cool videos like this drop on my channel. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.